So Psalm 84, whether you immediately notice the number 84 and think, oh yeah, I know that Psalm, da 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 da, or whether you go, I, wh which one is that? You know some of this Psalm at the very least if you don't know the whole thing. A lot of our Psalms actually come right out of here. This is just one more of those Psalms where we we may not sing what the sons of Korah who wrote this song and were temple musicians, we may not sing exactly the way they sing, sing it, sang, sang it, sang, sang, sorry. I should have gotten that right. I was just in Lubbock yesterday. You would think I'd have a little more twang. We may not sing it to the same tune, but we sing this with the same heart, I think. And we sing it in multiple songs. And I think that's very cool that we can know that we don't just worship the same God. We don't just sing some of the same ideas, but that from time to time, our words line up completely with brothers and sisters over thousands of years and we literally sing the same song across time together. It's really a cool thought when you stop and think about how many times we do that, that we are singing words David sang while at the temple worshiping, or that other brothers and sisters sang, uh, things that Hannah would have heard while she was praying for her child. We sing those. And I think it's a, a beautiful thought to stop and just kind of contemplate every now and then. We're going to start, like we do every week, with a reading of the psalm. So Psalm 84, this is going to be from, from the NIV. If you follow along in version, that is in there today. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallows a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord, God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor, and no good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. All right. So you can see the sons of Korah, whoever they were, we'll get to that in, in here in a second, but whoever they were, they had a heart for worship and a heart for God. And they just, as they, they use words like long and yearn, it kind of reminds you of the psalm about the deer that pants for water. It's kind of that same spirit in this psalm that they just, they long for it, much the same as yesterday. Um, on our, our trip, Curly and I were talking about it earlier. So I grew up in San Angelo. So in San Angelo has wonderful Tex-Mex and Mexican food. Those aren't the same thing. But they got really good examples of both. And I, I have very high standards and expectations because of that. Okay? Now, I don't, I'm not stepping on any toes. But when somebody grows up in West Texas, they have higher standards for what you call Mexican food than people who grew up in other Texas, okay? Any other Texas is just a thing. Or if you grew up in South Texas, the same thing. You go other parts of the state, and you go, well, now what was that, okay? So it gets so bad. I have a friend who said, you know, I'm really kind of tired of eating at Chili's. I've had enough Mexican food. And I went, I see you understand at least that much, right? I don't think that word means what you think it means. And so I, I just was in shock. So yesterday we went to Lubbock, and there's a place there that just is, it's one of those family-owned things that they moved to Lubbock from the town where they'd had a restaurant for like 50-something years, opened one up in Lubbock, and it's absolutely fantastic, and, um, and, and loved it. And you're sitting there, and you're eating that, and you think, good grief, I was totally off my, my low-carb thing yesterday, uh, and, and I'm going to pay for it all week. But I sat there, and I looked at this plate, and I just, I understood Psalm 84 all over again. 
My soul yearns. It longs, you know, for... Did everybody in Brownwood lose their bottle of cumin? Yeah, I don't know what it is. You, you, you walk into a Mexican food place, you don't smell cumin, you really know you should leave, okay? Now just get out. They, they've already ruined it. They already lost the plot. Anyway, so this was just like heavenly levels of cumin all over my plate. It was wonderful. Very, very good. That same kind of yearning that you have for that, or maybe you're a bluebell person, or maybe you're an iced tea person, and you just, you, you traveled, and it, you know, it used to be, this has changed. But it used to be you got too far away from here and you couldn't even get sweet tea at a restaurant. I don't drink that anymore, but you couldn't get it anywhere, anywhere. There was a time when I lived in places in America, America, where you couldn't get sweet tea or Dr. Pepper. You asked for a Coke and you know what they brought you? Pepsi. Which Tanya will tell you is ungodly and worthy of the worst hellfire. That's her opinion on Pepsi. It's, uh, she feels more, more strongly about Pepsi than I feel about iced coffee. What does that tell you? Don't mess with Tanya's Coke. That's all. That's what that tells you. So anyway, and you get to a point where, you know, you're kind of homesick and you yearn, you long for home, right? You long for those things that remind you of that. And it might be flavors or it might be scenes. It might be places and things that you do people and everything else you just you long for it when we drive west and it's true as much from here even though you know ranch over here in zephyr where my dad lives been the family since the 50s so i grew up a lot out there but still when you start driving west and especially if you drive i'm going to call it northwest although they call lubbock west texas you know a panhandle you start heading that way through the cotton fields around big spring la mesa Ackerley, in between that's my grandparents territory and the air changes. I don't know if it does for anybody else, mostly allergies for most people. But for me, it changes. Something just starts to feel more like home, right? Because everywhere from San Angelo to Ackerley is home for me, everywhere in there. That just all feels like home. When we would come back and visit from New York or from Russia, they just home. One time we flew from Russia to San Angelo. Normally we would fly to Dallas. One time we flew to San Angelo. You know why? Because at that time, it's changed now, but at that time, the best Chinese food in San Angelo, Texas, people would drive 100 miles all the way around to come to it, was at the cafe in the airport. And so we actually timed our flights to land in San Angelo at 6 o'clock because James had been a year and a half without sweet and sour chicken, you know? And I longed for home. That's just the way it is. You long for home. That's how they felt. Now, who were these people who write this song? Because you kind of need to understand where they're coming from. They're the sons of Korah. And the first thing that comes to most of our minds, if you're familiar with them at all, with the sons of Korah, is a rebellion. We don't think about praise and worship, but the sons of Korah in number 16 were those who led a rebellion against Moses and Aaron, saying, who, who do you people think you even are? What makes Moses and Aaron so special? Aren't we all Israelites? Aren't we all, it sounded very American, by the way. Aren't we all equal? And why don't we, and, and who should we, why should we have to listen to you? And da 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 Don't know exactly, I don't understand all of why they were as angry as they were. Maybe it's because, according to the law of Moses, the sons of Korah were the only ones who carried temple articles and different things they had to do. Well, not temple, tent of meeting articles and things. that were not allowed to use carts. Did you know that? Everybody else was allowed to use carts. But in their job, carrying things like the ark and all that, kind of, they were not allowed to use carts. They had to carry all their articles by hand. And maybe they were just like, why don't we get carts? I don't know. They were upset with Moses. They were upset with Aaron. And they just finally get to the point where they're like, we don't know who you think you are. But we're not listening anymore. And Moses says, okay, if you want to know, where our authority comes from, show up at the tent of meeting. Starts to sound like gun smoke. I want you to show up out there in front of the tent of meeting and we'll settle this once and for all. You can ask God, why do I have to listen to these two guys? So they show up at the tent of meeting. Moses and Aaron over here, these guys right there at the entrance of the meeting. They're there with their question and God answers mightily. Ground opens up, swallows them, and done. And it, do you think Moses looked around and went, 
Any more questions? We good? I don't know how he ended that meeting. How do you end that meeting? You just do like Kiwanis and ring a bell? I mean, what do you do? And I don't know. The bell carrier just went down. Maybe not. So anyway, you, they're swallowed up in the ground. It's like this really horrible story. And it's, of course, it's one that parents love to tell their children. If you question the authority of the two that God's put over you, ground, swallow, gone. Okay? They love that. Just like the parents love to have children memorize Ephesians 6, 1 to around 3 or 4. They stop wherever that is where it starts to say, fathers, do not exasperate, or you don't memorize that. You memorize, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. This is the first commandment that comes with a promise. See what my parents did? I got that one down. Okay, same kind of thing here. And that's what we remember. We remember that they rebelled and God answered and they were toast. We kind of forget that there were sons of Korah who did not join into his rebellion. There were others that, that stood off and watched and went, I don't think this is a good idea, guys. And they survived. We hear about them later in the book of Numbers. And they went back to their job. They took care of the things of the temple and carried the, or the tent of meeting at this point. And it just, I say temple because it carried on into the temple age. And they did their job. And they became a lot of the musicians. They became the temple musicians. And uh, when you read, you know, play the harp and the lyre, well, this is the guys who would have done it. And they would have, have been people who had a, a choir there. When David says for the choir, and sometimes he says for the sons of Korah or for Korah, this is what they're talking about. This group of people, this group of men that sang and played and wrote songs and psalms for temple worship out in the the courts of the temple. So we have about, I think it's 13 or 14 of their psalms. Of course, this is is one of them. And we can see what they wrote and what they sang about. And it's very different than the the tune that their forefathers, who were swallowed swallowed up whole in the ground, very, very different tune from those guys. It's not whining. It's not complaining. It's not griping. It's not rebellious. It's faithful. It's praise. And it's a longing to be with and be right with their God. Okay, so we're going to look at this. There's just a few sections to this psalm that I think are good to kind of break down and look at one at a time. So today, I, I'm wearing my, my, my Hawaiian shirt. You might have just thought, well, he's getting awful lax. Well, no, there's actually a purpose to this. I'm kind of wearing one of my illustrations, so which I don't mind doing, but that's kind of what I'm doing. So I got my Hawaiian shirt and my jeans and my hoodads or whatever they're called, and I feel pretty relaxed because my mind went and looking at this psalm, where's one of the places that I love to be, place where uh, there is always worship and praise, and it's, it's on this hillside. This is a hillside in central New York at Camp Hunts, the oldest Church Christ Christian camp in existence, and on this uh, hill, not anything all that special. You're not missing much if you can't quite make out the picture. It's just, except that it's green. I thought I would give you a little bit of green. Y'all remember what that looked like when there's rain? Pray. And uh, that's, this, actually, this picture was taken in a, that's in a drought. That's what they call drought in central New York, okay? So really nice and green. But none of that's really the important part. The important part is the people gathered on the hill. This is during a camp session we went and taught last year. Uh, for a week at the camp. My favorite time is actually uh, either to be there at that camp session or at the men's retreat. In September, they'll have a men's retreat, and I was looking at their schedule for that the other day and seeing what they were not going to get to go, but I was looking at that and thinking, you know, memories and things of being on that hillside. Whatever your place is that's like that, where you go and you worship God and you have fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, where you've said at times, it could be a class, it could be just a lunch you have with brothers and sisters now and then, whatever it is, wherever it is, where you just every now and then stop and go, man, if life could be just like this every day, it can be a worship, you know, just a, some Sunday, everything just hits you just right, and it's a worship service or, or something like that, or having your grandmother when you were a little kid Uh, have you sit on her knee while she read you a Bible story, those kinds of things where you just remember, I wish life could always be just like this. Because when it's like this, boy, I just, 
I know I'm in the presence of God. Everybody has those times and places and, and, and can have those times and places. And this is what they're writing about. They're writing about, I long to be at that place, at that time, and in that moment with my God. And we long and we hunger and we thirst for that. People who grew up going to Christian camp, maybe you still go, that's a thing for you. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Because everybody who ever goes to Christian camp seems like at some point goes, man, I wish it could be like this all the time. But Friday always comes or Saturday always comes. At some of them, they break out Michael W. Smith, friends are friends forever, and half the people boo-hoo like they're at a funeral, and everybody has to go, oh, we got to go back to real life. Somebody from the 80s always starts going back to life, back to, you know, it happens every single time. That's what always goes through my head driving back. That's scary for you, I know, but that's what happens. You got to go back to life. And they felt the same way. And it's written in this psalm. So let's look at this. First, they long to be at the temple. Verse 3, even the sparrow, they get jealous of the sparrow. The sparrow gets to make a nest up in the temple. And you can kind of picture that, can't you? Picture what you believe that the temple looked like from those pictures and illustrations you've seen of what the temple looked like and looking up way up high in Solomon's temple. Way up high up there is a sparrow making their nest just like those birds try to make nests on your back porch every now and then. I, we have a constant mess of birds constantly trying to make nests on our porch. And he goes, you know, I'd give anything to be a sparrow that gets to live right here at the place of God's worship and the place of prayer and the place of his presence. Wouldn't that be awesome? And they say, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Verse 5, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. This is an interesting phrase because we don't do so much pilgrimage in the way that, that they did. So once Jerusalem was settled and established, you know, the place God, where God kept saying, once you get to the city that I will choose, once they got there and the temple was built, people made pilgrimages to come to Jerusalem. We kind of think almost like every Jew lived in Jerusalem. It's not true at all. They lived all over the Middle East, and certainly by the time of the Gospels. I mean, they're, they're everywhere the Roman Empire was, and so and they find things that show they were in China. So you've got people all over the place, but what did they do? They would always say at every Passover, they would end it with next year in Jerusalem, because it was a longing to go to Jerusalem and to be in the place where the temple was, before that, where the tent was, the tabernacle. And they longed to be there. And so these sons of Korah are writing about that, that, that pilgrims love to come and to visit where they know is the ark and the presence of God. Blessed are those whose heart is set on pilgrimage, who have determined, I love the Lord, and I'm going to go back every chance I get. And then he uses this phrase. It's down in verse uh, 7. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. And I was looking at that. And I thought, what does it mean by they go from strength to strength? We kind of Let's go back to verse 6 and catch something else that I, can't, I think it, it helps us understand. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools, which we could use some of that right now, right? Valley of Baca, we don't know where that is. Like, we don't know, wh what are they talking about? There's, you can't go back to your, your little Bible map in the back of your Bible and find, oh, the Valley of Baca, there it is. This valley, the name of it just means the valley of, it can either mean willows, but that doesn't make sense to any of the, the scholars. They think it probably is its other meaning, which is the Valley of Baca, which is the Valley of Tears and Mourning. They go through the valley of tears and through the valley of mourning. Think about it this way, like Psalm 23, the valley of the shadow of death. They go through what? Life. They long to be in the place of God's presence. They long to be in the temple. They love to be the bird, but they keep having to go through real life. Does that seem familiar? I'd love it if every day was like the best day at Christian summer camp ever. It's not. It's not, 
For one thing, that lady and, and team in there are cooks, ain't cooking for you every day. I think that's, that was always the thing when we would leave camp and go back to Troy. It was always like, you mean we got to start cooking again? Yeah, you got to start cooking again. You got to start cleaning again. You got to start working again. Everything you go back to. And that can feel sometimes like drudgery. I mean, if we're honest, that's just true. Not every day is that way. There's lots of ups and downs and goods and bads. But he says they go through that. And blessed are those who are willing to go through that, those whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, those who are willing to make the journey, to make the trip. And even though they have to go through some things that are hard, and even though they have to go through some things that are mourning and weeping, either from loss or from repentance, to arrive at the place of God is a blessing. But you got to be willing to go through what you got to go through to get there. So verse 7, from strength to strength. And when I read that, I think about, you know, there's people that go, they just go from strength to strength. And it just sounds so positive, like they just get stronger and stronger and it's never, never any problem. And that's not what he means at all, is it? Where do you gain your strength? Back in the Valley of Baca, right? In the hardship times. So they get stronger and they get stronger as they get closer and closer to God. And one of the words... The Hebrew words that's used here from strength to strength has reference to stopping at, and that's why the picture, stopping at an oasis. So picture it this way. On your pilgrimage, you go from oasis to oasis, being refreshed and being strengthened, being revived, stopping, drinking again from the living water, stopping and, and getting again some rest, and some time. We were watching the other day a YouTube video. I don't know if y'all are familiar with uh, any of you who are into motorcycles and stuff. Itchy Boots is a YouTube channel. This lady rides her motorcycle adventure bike all, o literally, all over the world. And her latest season, she's crossing Africa, like the continent, Africa, the whole thing. And she's all over the place. And as she is, she's running into a million problems, right? And the other day we were watching one where she's, she's riding up across the desert, and it's, I mean, it's sand, everything that means desert to you, in the Sahara, all of that, and she rides up to, all of a sudden, this river, and it's completely dry, and the sand has taken over, and the sand has blown in it, and it looks like waves of water, except it's all just sand. The river's just gone. But on the other side is an oasis. Pool of water, palm trees, all of that, like an oasis. And she goes into this town and the ride in. And you, you're watching this video that you can almost feel the relief that must be to be coming in from the desert and suddenly here is water and here are helpful, kind people and here is a shower and a room and a, an inn and all of this. From strength to strength, from oasis to oasis, a person of faith moving toward God will still go through all their valleys and all their deserts and all their hardships, challenges, and growth. But you will keep coming to oasis after oasis, refreshment after refreshment, because that's who God is. That's why he calls us together on Sunday. It's not to keep a tradition. It's to keep a life. It's to revive a spirit. It's to walk up to the oasis from the desert and be revived and find rest for your souls. It's not a legalistic requirement. It is a life-giving blessing of God. So from strength to strength, from oasis to oasis, they go until, and I love this image, until each one of them, one by one, leaves this life and finds themselves appearing before God in Zion. That's the big picture, isn't it? We go from strength to strength, from refreshment to refreshment. Then he says, verse 8, Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. There's a song, and, and we need to learn it. 
I finally found the, the slides for it, but only this morning. So we're, we're not doing it today, but uh, I'll, I'll get it together maybe for next week during the communion if we can hit, get that thing to hit play. Uh, as every now and then, technology. So we will uh, learn this song, but there's a song written, Better is One Day in Your Court than a thousand elsewhere written by uh, Matt Redmond well really written by the sons of Korah and adapted by Matt Matt Redmond and Halal they sing it as well and isn't that the attitude every Christian believer ought to have that to know God and to spend even one moment in worship of God one moment in prayer with God one moment in the word of God one moment in the spirit of God it's better than a thousand anywhere else. A lot of us have to learn that the hard way, don't we? In our valley of Baca, basically. We learn the hard way. We go, oh, well, I don't know. This might be almost as good. Oh, this is so bad. And then we find out, no, even a thousand days there doesn't make up one of life with Jesus. And so we long and we yearn. But we don't have to long and yearn out in the desert forever, do we? Because he calls us to him at every oasis. He calls us to him in the big picture to appear before him. And then the question becomes, am I making the journey? Am I following Jesus? Because if you follow Jesus, this is where you go. You end up at the place of living water that revives your soul. You end up before your God in Zion. And you do not end up before your God in Zion afraid that he will reject you when you follow Jesus. You show up ready to praise and ready to join the sons of Korah in that praise in the courts of your God because you're home. 